This is the Power to Podcast, show 105. What are the what are the things that we can do to make sure that we leverage the message? And it's not just about telling the story, it's about leveraging the moment because there's a difference between storytelling and there's a difference between telling somebody something and connecting to the emotion of the event. Because when you connect to the emotion of the event, then there's a better chance for that story to be told well beyond the time that the event takes place. Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Ken Herman, host of the Power to Podcast, and I am here with my co-host, Mr. Matt, the hashtag PV Braves Rogers. Matt, tonight was on the top list of just awesome recordings for us. All of our guests are amazing, but selfishly, I know this was a conversation that you and I were, were both looking forward to very much. We had on Joe Sanfilippo, who is an amazing educator, an amazing superintendent, a very, very popular author and speaker that we've both seen speak separately. So I recently saw him and interacted with him, and that's kind of what what spawned this this recording tonight. But you saw him, we're estimating, maybe five years ago. So what what was the experience like for you tonight? And you can also say hi to everybody. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it was really interesting. Ken and I were talking just after the we recorded the interview about how I remember leaving um, his keynote after having done a bunch of conferences and having almost conference fatigue. Oh, the keynote kind of says this uplifting message that kids matter and you matter and you know, community matters. Um, And I remember leaving feeling with the feeling like the keynote with Joe had action plans associated to the it matters, you know, how I could go home and turn that into work and effort. And I mentioned to Ken, I made a terrible logo for our school at Salisbury terrible, I got mocked by coworkers. Um, And then we invited our friend Dylan to, to improve it. And I turned it into a full-fledged professional banner that, um, you know, is out there for Meet the Teacher Night and kindergarten registration and families are taking, they make it into a balloon arch and uh, for the music performance, these different things that kind of separate it and really remember that school is a special place for everyone that walks in those doors, even though everyone has to go, you know, that it's a joy and a privilege to go to the schools that we get to work in. Yeah, tonight, uh, Joe really offers us ideas for how we can make big changes in our district, big changes in our classroom, but also focus in on the small moments that matter and create an impact for our our students. And so he's in the position of superintendent, but has not lost sight of what it's like to be in the classroom. And so it was really interesting as we went through our conversation tonight, I feel like he was able to offer perspective and advice on things that if we have superintendents listening, can take away key actionable items, as well as our our classroom teachers that I know are listening to the podcast and every position in between. And so it, it, it did not disappoint in any fashion, just real, authentic, relevant, just great conversation from someone who who gets it totally agree i I couldn't say it better myself and um, i would even say you know that doesn't you don't need to have an official title you don't need to have a contract position Um, i think that's the beauty of joe's message is that everyone that has any part in any student's 
life in in his district has a valuable opportunity. And not only does he say that, he backs it up with action. And I think that's the most beautiful thing. You'll hear this very early on that, you know, if if he's going to preach it, he is going to live it. Um, And and you'll hear hear that throughout the entire episode. Absolutely. So I don't want to delay this any further. I want to jump right into that conversation. So we'll hear from Teach Better and then we'll we'll hear from Joe Sanfilippo. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. Hi, Joe. Welcome to the Powered Up Podcast. How are you doing tonight? Fantastic. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't incredibly excited to, to jump into this conversation with you. Matt and I have both followed you for, for years. Uh, we've both seen you keynote, which was a, a great experience for us actually at, at separate times, which I'm sure will come up tonight. But uh, you're definitely an educator that we've followed for a long time and, and really uh, enjoy and, res- and respect following as well. So to kick things off for us, keep it nice and simple. Just officially introduce yourself. Let us know where you're coming from, as if people probably don't already know that. And just kind of give us a snapshot of what your career in education has looked like. Well, my, my name is Joe Sanfilippo. I'm the, the superintendent in the Fall Creek School District, home of the Fall Creek Crickets. And this is my 12th year as the superintendent in this spot. Uh, prior to that, I taught second grade. I taught, I taught kindergarten. I taught second grade. I taught fifth grade. I was a counselor and a coach at the high school. And um, so this is now also my 25th year uh, in education. Is it 20? What is this? 22. So yeah, 25th year in education. And uh, it has been an incredible ride and, and not, and nothing. I mean, and honestly, the last 12 years in Fall Creek, Wisconsin has been the best of my life. Uh, it's been just a wonderful experience. So to be able to do the things that we've been able to do and, and think about it a little bit different. Think about, you know, just the way that we, we, we put the word out there a little bit differently. I think it's been fun to, to, uh, to see that uh, momentum go along the way. That's great. And I think so many people know of you as a, as a great speaker, author, and, and your work in Fall Creeks and, and uh, Go Crickets and, and your presentations. And when I saw you speak this uh, a few weeks ago, this past winter, I honestly had, I didn't know your teaching background until it came up in, in your presentation. So what I would love to know is what was your classroom like when you taught second grade? If you met up with a couple of your kids right now that you had back in second grade or fifth kindergarten, whichever grade level you want to talk about, how would they describe your classroom? What would stick out to them? What would they remember about you as a teacher? That's, it's interesting that you say that because I did, I met up with one of them about, um, gosh, it must've been about, well, I mean, I talked to him every now and again, his name is Colin Abendroth and he's a, he's a, a teacher in um, in uh, uh, um, in Arizona right now, but he was, um, we kind of go back and forth because I wrote a little bit about him in, in lead from where you are. So we kind of go back and forth sometimes on when some things come up and, um, and it's so interesting to me what he remembers and what I remember about school. And the cool, one of the cool things about Colin is um, that, you know, he was, he was in, uh, in my second grade class and I got a chance to go back and keynote in Pulaski, Wisconsin, where I started my teaching career a couple of years ago. And he, and when I went back to keynote, that was his first day teaching second grade in Pulaski. So I got to be there for it and talk to him about some of the great things that were happening. So the really interesting thing was about what, it, what he remembers about class and what I remember about class. And, you know, I think what I remember about what I remember about being a teacher was making sure that everything was prepared and ready. And I wanted to create these moments and these opportunities for kids, but I never really invested in those moments because I was always getting to the next thing. And so when he started talking about all the stuff that we used to do and I didn't remember it, I actually kind of felt bad. And I thought, man, think about all the things that I missed because I was just preparing for the next thing. And it's, it's great that he had those moments and it's, I, I, that's what I want first and foremost, but selfishly, I want some of those too, because it, when you don't get them, you start to wonder why you do what you do. So we did a lot of stuff that we, we did play a lot of games and we did a lot of, you know, kinesthetic stuff because I wanted to get people, all kids up and moving around. And, you know, from the beginning, I've been, I think I've been kind of involved in video for a long time because 
from the beginning, every every year we did a highlight video of our classroom in second grade and fifth grade. And so at the end of the year, we had a big party with the parents and I had a bunch of pictures that we put together and man, just splicing video took forever in the late nineties. And so we did, uh, at the, we'd have a party and show the video and that's why that's kind of how it came up with Colin because he posted a picture of the videotape of our video from that year in 90, what would have been 98. So, um, we just kind of went back and forth on that, but man, I, I don't, I think that my, the classrooms that I see today in, uh, in Fall Creek, Wisconsin are, are vastly different to the ones that I had when I was in Pulaski, Wisconsin, and they are so much better now because we know kids better and our teachers are able to really get to the heart of what kids need as opposed to me running like a reading log, you know what I mean? So, I mean, it was it was a really interesting transition. So it's, it's been fun to see that, uh, you know, to see where kids are and, and uh, what it looks like now, as opposed to what it looked like when I was teaching. Can I, can I challenge you a little bit on that? You challenge me, whatever you want. So I guess one of the things that we feel, so I'm a fourth grade teacher. Ken is a, a technology coach. So pretty directly connected to the classroom do you feel at all you're, you're mentioning uh, teachers now know kids so much deeper and, you know, the ways are, are so specific to, um, you know, all the nuances of modern day teaching. And, you know, in a lot of ways, teaching is, you know, people skills and, you know, being prepared, as you mentioned. How do you feel like you can still be attached to giving high quality feedback being relatively detached from the classroom? We see a lot of uh, administrators and talk to administrators that the further they get away from the classroom, they lose a little bit of that touch of, you know, what it's really like to be in the trenches. How do you stay really intertwined um, to give feedback and support and really, you know, guidance uh, to your staff members? Well, I think you got to be there, first of all. And if you're not there, don't make suggestions on what it's supposed to look like when you're not there. So if, if I'm going to if I'm going to tell people that I want them to meet kids at the door when they walk in, cause I want them to feel loved, supported and safe when they walk in. But when people walk in for a meeting, I'm not doing the same thing. Then what are we really doing? So I think you got to be cognizant of what you're modeling. And I think you can't be in every space at every point, but what you can do is every time that you get the group together, what are you modeling? What it should look like in the classroom when they are in their classroom with, with their kids. And if you're not modeling what it looks like, you kind of just, you know, you, it makes it really, it makes it a lot more difficult to provide any suggestions for, uh, for that space. I think the farther you're totally right, Matt, like the farther that you get from the space, the harder it is to make suggestions. If you're, um, if you're, if, if you're not there and rightfully so, like my, my staff shouldn't listen to me if I'm not in that space and they, you know, but they, in my position, they don't have to, Right. If our principals aren't in that space, they're going to find, you know, in a, a more difficult situation. I don't have to be because I'm in charge of the adults who are taking care of the adults who are taking care of the kids. Right. Like I'm in charge of the five administrators in our building that are in charge of taking care of the adults who are taking care of the kids. And so if I'm taking care of them and I'm modeling what it looks like when we meet, then I would I would hope that that it would look like that for meetings that they have, which would in turn lead to connections in the classroom. So um, I think it's just you, to decide who you're supervising. And if you're supervising that group, whatever group they are, if they're 4, 14, 24, 44, whatever group, whatever age level they are, think about how you're going to make the biggest impact on them by being in that space as often as you can. So if I'm with my administrative team, I can meet with them once a week, but at the same time, how much time am I spending with them in their office or in their hallway or, you know, in the, in the lunchroom as they're, as they're watching kids or whatever. Like I want to be in the spaces that they're doing their work too and have conversations with them about what it looks like. Um, just because I want them to know that they're supportive. People tell me all the time. They're like, well, you know what we want to do? We want to hire great people and then we want to get out of the way. And I'm like, no, you don't. That's dumb. Like, why would you want to do that? Like, if I hire somebody great, I want to see them doing great stuff. Like, it's like buying a really expensive car and loving it and putting it in the garage and saying, 
not only am I not going to drive you, I'm not even going to be in the garage to look at you. I mean, seriously, <laughs> right? So let's be, let's be cognizant of like, if, if you want to, I want to hire great people, but then I want to see them do great things because I hired great people. So a- as you were saying that, I, I completely agree with you. And I was even thinking about in, in my position, I'm mostly working with, with teachers. I'm still in the classroom on a daily basis, but I'm usually there to model if I'm working with the students and or co-teachers or support those teachers. And sometimes I often feel as though teachers forget what it's like to be a learner or right. to be a student. So as administrators become disconnected with what it's like to be a teacher, our teachers become disconnected with what it's like to be a student. And we have all seen in here, you know, teachers are the worst students when you're in faculty meetings. They're talking when they're not supposed to and, and doing all those things they get frustrated at, at, at students with. How do you, how have you challenged administrators and even teachers to, to, step in, to, to step back and to remember what it was like or to recognize that they're, they are not being where they're supposed to be or modeling the way they're supposed to? Because I often do struggle sometimes where I just want to, I want to work with a teacher and help them realize that part of it is they need a little bit more empathy towards the students that they're struggling with or realize that they need to put a little bit more trust into their students to be able to step up and do what they think they can't do. So what are strategies you use to, to encourage, but also challenge their mindset a little bit in, in thinking in those directions? I think you take it on the same way, right? Like you, like you can't tell them, you can't tell them to do something different if you don't know where they start. Right. So like we talk about the idea that everybody's A to B is different and nobody, regardless of age will move from A to B if you don't value where they start. So uh, when we started talking about what it meant like in, you know, we, we talk in our building a lot about how if the only people learning in your building are ages four to 18, then you're doing it wrong. So how are we making sure that the people who are in charge of leading the learning for kids are also learning in the process? And I think our biggest get on that whole thing was the passion projects that we do. And we allow our staff members to dive into something that they're passionate about. And they have multiple days throughout the course of the year that are passion project days where they just invest in that passion. It could be meditation. It could be um It could be um, a a documentary for kids. It could be building a business with kids. It could be um, mindfulness. It could be, I'm just thinking of things that happened in the last couple of years, Um, um, building breakout EDU boxes, you know, little things that they want to try, things that they haven't done before. And we let them dive into it. And what we found in doing that was when we allowed them to own their learning, they knew what it felt like. And when they knew what it felt like, they allowed kids to do the same. It wasn't that they didn't want to do it. It was that they didn't know what it felt like. So when you talk to them about what it feels like, then they'll, they'll make the transition. And so every year that we send a, a, a survey out to our staff to ask them, um, does this process, or do you believe, do you believe this process makes you a better teacher? And we've been given the survey for, eight years now, it's never gone below 94% yes. So if your PD process is yielding a 94% satisfaction for your staff, like something's going well. So they just want to know how to learn, how to use it. And it translates. Now we've got, man, we've got kids at the middle school involved, like in, in a launch program where they don't have study hall in the seventh and eighth grade level anymore. They have launch. So they get a chance to just dive into any project that they want. So just to think about that, like you take study hall away from a kid, what is that going to do until you replace it with them allowing, allowing them to learn whatever they want? And now all of a sudden it's the most popular part of the day for a lot of kids, for some kids, no, but for kids that are looking for their place, that's the most important piece of the day. And that's the, Matt, the I'm, reason I'm they're getting up. Go ahead. Follow up here. Sorry, because I remember hearing about this in, in, when I saw you present recently and it, it really stuck with me, the passion projects because high quality PD is, is one of my top priorities, not only as an instructional coach, but with some of the consulting I do as well. And in my classroom, student centered learning was so important. And I think one of the best things I did was trust my kids explicitly tell them I trust them and show them how I trusted them by giving them freedom. 
how did you logistically roll out this idea of passion projects to replace, I think you said three to four days of professional development in your district. So me as an instructional coach, how can I, how can I pitch this idea and what are some of the logistical pieces I can put into place to say, here's where it can look like our first year, here's where it can look like year three, working with our teachers and, and, and in, in an administrator's mind, giving up those, those days, even though I know that that's not what we're doing. Yeah. Right. Well, I think the first thing is you let the, you let the teachers own the process. If you're going to tell them that you want them to own their learning, can you have them own the process of owning their learning? And so we had a group of six people that took it on and they, it was, ours was kind of born out of the fact that the state was changing the conversation about what PD looked like. And I wasn't confident enough in how the state was going to do it to just sit back and let them do something. So we decided to do something and get it approved before they changed everything. So then we could just do what we wanted to do. So we got out in front of it. We had six teachers build this program and we, they came up with the criteria. What's, you know, what is a good passion project? What is not a good passion project? How are we making sure that, that we're all learning? Um, and then, and go from there. So they started out by putting the criteria together of what they were looking for. Then they presented it to staff to talk about what they were looking for. I didn't even bring the administrators into the conversation until we had it all established already. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to make sure that nobody outside of the, you know, the six that were there, I didn't want anybody to think that there was, this was top down, or this was driven by the administration and they're, you know, they have, a, they, they built it. Uh, we didn't build any of it. I talked to the six people and I said, Hey, I just need something better. Cause right now I don't think we're getting, we're not maxing out on this right now. And you don't think so either because we know that, you know, PD is what it is right now is we're not getting a lot of engagement. So why don't we just build something that you're going to be proud of? And they did, man, they built something beautiful. So they have, they had criteria, they had a timeline. Um, we had merit pay associated with it in our district because, um, that was what was changing over from the, uh, from the state's perspective. And so with, for, for us, you, it, the merit pay piece of it doesn't have, it doesn't have anything to do with results at all. It's, are you invested in the process? Did you go through the process? And if the process worked great, but if the process didn't work, did you come up for, with reasons why the process didn't work and what you're going to adjust next year moving forward? I've had so many conversations with people. I just had one last week with, a, with a, a guy that was talking about some of the stuff that he's done over the last two years. He said, Joe, I never would have done that. Like I never even would have considered doing this if it wasn't for the passion projects. And, um, and so you have to also understand as the administrator that the first two years are going to look exactly like PD has looked for years prior because people are scared and they don't know what it's supposed to look like. And when they say, well, why don't you just tell me what it's supposed to look like? And you tell them, I'm not going to tell you that. Then they keep things really close to the chest because they're afraid of what the response is going to be from the administrator. So when the response from the administrator is, that's fantastic. Here's how much you grew. Now, let's see what it looks like going into next year. Now they develop some trust. Now, are there some people in Fall Creek, Wisconsin, that in the first two years, like kind of sandbagged a little bit, right? And didn't do, didn't really expand, you know, yeah, absolutely there were, but I don't make decisions based on people that don't want to get better. So we changed that. The re, the way that we changed that process up was instead of them turning their stuff into me after about four years, we started doing a street fair. So you presented your project to your, to your colleagues. You can tell me anything you want and write it down. And I'm going to read it on a Sunday in May. And I don't, you can lie about whatever you want, but you cannot do that for your colleagues. Absolutely not. You put out something that you didn't do, they will call you out. So that's been a huge get for us along the way. I love the, the thought of accountability and, you know, intrinsic motivation, which I think we all see as the golden ticket of education. And and you're talking from the lens of your launch program for your seventh and eighth graders, and obviously with your staff as well, when you put it into their hands, it just 
goes so much further than we would expect, you know, based off a deadline and, and what you have to do to, you know, be compliant year into year out. I guess my question for you really is you've, you've fostered an environment of being um, proactive in a lot of ways. Now, mind you, Joe, I haven't seen you speak, unfortunately, in probably about six years. Um, but that being said, what I, what I took away and was found so powerful was I felt like you were on the right side of, you know, that education conversation as a leader, as opposed to being reactive anytime you could be. So even these examples of putting teachers in the right position or students in the right position, you know, if the students are motivated, then the behaviors are down and the grades, you know, you're, you're not fighting kids to be at school. If the, the lost time that was study hall turns into value and the accountability of teachers finding something and, and being given the permission to go and do something incredible, you know, yes, are you going to have to justify it, but you're going to need to justify it to yourself more than you're going to justify it to me. So where do you, because being on that progressive ahead of the, you know, proactive nature is kind of an uncomfortable place to be. How do you continue to stay in that side of things? And I'm sure you would say that you're not always there, but how do you continue in, you know, this general realm? We all recognize that that's helpful, but staying there is really tough. Yeah. I, and I, I would add, I would advocate for people to not stay there because if you're always living in discomfort, you never know what it feels like to get any better. So we tell people that we want you out of your comfort zone, but we also want you to be in your comfort zone too. If there are things that are non-negotiable for you that, that keep you in your comfort zone in a time where you need to be in your comfort zone, stay there. But during this time, take a jump out and it doesn't even need to be take a jump out, take a step out. If a step out for you, is a little uncomfortable and that's okay, do that. If jumping out and flying off a cliff is where you need to be, then do that. I don't care. I mean, I can't tell you, I can't tell you what your level is. And, I, and the second that I tell you how much you're supposed to grow, I've already lost you because how am I supposed to know where you started? So, I mean, that there's, there's an, the concept that we keep in mind is that if you want people to value their learning, you got to value the time that they have when they're to do their learning and value their journey. It's their journey. It's not yours. You're just a, it's like a chapter in a story. And so if you can keep that in mind, then we always just try to move people forward in the best way possible for them, not for me. Like I want everybody to be better, but the last thing that I wanted a bunch of San Filippo clones around this place. My gosh, would that be awful? So, you know, when you expect yourself in others, then you get the same thing. I don't want that. I think about all the things that we used to do that, um, that, you know, people started doing it, you know, the way that I was doing it or whatever. And I kept thinking to myself, oh man, this is not going to end well. Cause they don't have the same personality as me. And there's, nothing wrong with that and not only is there nothing wrong with that it's better that they don't so how do we you know value where they're at and if they're trying to be something that they're not i'm not a very great i'm not a good leader if i'm making them be something that they're not so value where they're at and start with it and then you know just make sure that you you know them well enough to know where their comfort zone is and what they're willing to do to step out of it if if you know if wherever they're at I, geez, man, I think if you don't know who your people are and what they want to do and what their comfort zone is, what they're comfortable with, but also where they want to go, you find yourself in a really difficult position. I had a teacher, I have a teacher here. He's fantastic. And I, I remember I went up to him one day and I, I asked him, have you ever thought about being a principal? Because man, you are, you are a fantastic leader. I love, I love what you do. I love how people follow you. I think you'd be phenomenal principle if you've ever thought about it i mean if you need something i can help you with that process if you're looking to do something and he's like oh no 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 i was i, I like what i'm doing and then he i left and whatever the next day i walked past his room and he said hey can you come in here for a second and i went in and he closed the door and which is not a good sign and so he, and he's like hey with that that conversation that we had yesterday about being a principal and i said yeah yeah he said that really ticked me off and i'm like what do you mean he goes he said 
I want to be the best teacher I can be. And yesterday you made me feel like I should be something different. And I said, oh my goodness, I did. And so first of all, I'm happy that he said something. So I knew him well enough to know that he would he'd be, he'd be willing to say something. Second of all, I was trying to create what I needed. If I needed a principal, he would be a great principal, right? That's not what he needed. So we're going to put expectations on somebody else and they have no desire to be in that realm. We're not only shortchanging them, but we're also shortchanging the process of, you know, of, of growth across the board. So you've been, you've been in Fall Creek for, for 12 years now as the superintendent <clears throat> and the, the programs that you're talking about, the, the changes that you're making from a leadership standpoint, I think are all centered around, like you're saying about being who you are, growing from where you start. And it's really, it's all about developing a, a culture for learning. Right. And I think that's such a important aspect when you, when you focus in all the way down to the classroom level, students have a passion and an interest for learning, for being curious, and it's important K through 12. And it seems to dwindle farther and farther away as we get into the older and older grades. How have you seen the the ideas and the culture of learning that you've created along with your other administrators and along with these you know the six teachers the passion projects and other teachers for other for other ideas you rolled out how have you seen that impact all the way down to developing a culture for learning in your schools so you mentioned the launch program but even more specifically just in the da daily interactions of a classroom and then also have you enjoyed the fruits of the, those labors over the last two years, because a thing I hear now more than I've ever heard before is the students coming back from, from the pandemic. Once we were kind of back to like being in school every day, it was, they have no intrinsic motivation. They're not interested in doing, they don't, they're not even motivated by grades anymore. It's, it's all about how students just have a much less motivation than they did four or five years ago. And I think that culture of learning is something that we need to grow and foster in a classroom. But how have you seen that progression boil all the way down to the classroom? Level? Well, I think the first thing that we saw was how kids were taking on their own learning or what, what it looked like for them. So we have the launch program at the middle school. We have we do a lot of uh, you know genius hour stuff at the elementary school and at the high school. Uh, we implemented a capstone project. So there's a senior capstone. So in order to graduate, you have to do a senior capstone project, which is essentially the passion project that we do with adults. We do it with kids. And so we have kids that create stuff. We have we had two people present yesterday uh, at our board meeting. One uh, made her own book of poetry, uh, all her own poems, and, and um, she's looking to publish that. And then we had one that developed... Uh, uh, built a music box and the music box had like a that string of music like it was on a piece of paper that went through the music box it was like an old time music box it was very cool but the music that went through it was an original score that she had produced so you know if we have these if we figure out ways that these kids can do some of these really cool things we had a kid that you know took a uh, um, a camper, an old camper, and built a, an ice shanty out of it with everything. I mean, he could sell this thing in a heartbeat. We've had people that have connected with health organizations in the uh, in the community and have you know gotten internships out of those conversations, right? Because not only do they create these things, but then they present their, their findings. They present what they do to a group uh, to a group of teachers administrators, and then somebody from the community in that particular field. So now we're bringing people into the community that we see, you know, um, and, and they get to present to them, which means now they're connected to somebody in the industry that they're looking to get into. And now we've created this opportunity for them. And it really started because a lot of our kids were going to college and or tech school or college, you know, they're doing something at secondary, post-secondary education, and they'd get two years into it or, or a year and a half or two years in there, like, man, I hate this. I can't believe I spent all this money doing this. I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. So we were like, well, let's back it up. Let's do it when you're not paying for it. And when you're not paying for it, let's see if it works. If it works, that's great. If not, go try something else. So anyway, I say that because that's the kind of culture we're, we're uh, you know, providing for our students because it's born out of our teachers are doing it. Our kids are doing it. 
We're bringing it to the community so our, our community knows what it looks like. Our board is invested in it. I mean, so we're thinking about how are we making sure that we're all learners in this regard. And I think we, we ended up, I mean, when, it, when the pandemic struck, we were actually, I think, farther ahead. The pandemic didn't really hit us from a, from a tech side at all, actually, uh, because everybody had stuff already. It was just getting hotspots to people. That was really the biggest issue for us, uh, just to make sure that they were connected in rural Wisconsin. But for the most part, everybody had their stuff. We had our classroom set up online. We had everything. So it wasn't that much of an issue. But what I told our staff after is when we get out of this thing, whenever we get out of this thing, the only problem, the only issue when we get out of this thing is if everything goes back exactly the way that it was before we started. And if we didn't learn from it, we've lost out on, a, on the only positive to come out of the pandemic, which was a change in the way that we instruct. And so I don't see, I, I guess I don't see when people say that kids don't have intrinsic motivation to do anything or, you know, they're just not, they don't want to be learners anymore. I don't know if that's true. I think they just learn differently now and we got to make sure that we tap into where they're at too. I mean, you know, you, you will, our, I, our teachers, I'm, I'm sorry, I love them dearly, but they will never be as entertaining as a YouTube video. They just won't. They, and I mean, you're not going to be as entertaining as a viral video that you're just not. And that's okay. But you also have to understand, we, so we talked about this idea that when we went to virtual and we did the online teaching, I did, I, I made, I, I made the equation to the analogy that you're, you're talking about like Mr. Rogers and, and, uh, and Irwin and Steve Irwin and um, um, what's Bob Ross. Like, I mean, all these, all these people that, that everybody's like, well, just do what they do. Well, they got production crews, boy. Like they got people, right. They got lighting, <laughs> they got scripts. They're not doing it for eight hours a day. And I said, just do the best that you can and create an opportunity. You don't have to be those people. What you got to do is you got to connect. So the connection is just different, but you still had to have it. And that, I think, put us in a different situation. And then now it's translated into we learn differently. Our, you know, the, the stuff that we set up at the middle and high school for the online component, it ended up flipping a lot of our classrooms when we came back because all that content was created already and there. So kids could see it and then ask questions. And it was like, we flipped the classroom without even like going through the nine hour training of what do you do to flip a classroom? Cause we just did it. So I think if we, if that's how we come out of it, I think we're better for it. So I guess, <clears throat> You know, and Ken, maybe you can chime in on this. Joe, I feel the same way. Like our district was in the right side of things where, you know, we had an LMS and we had, you know, fluency with, you know, one-to-one -one devices. And yeah, those hot spots, getting those out were probably the biggest challenge. But more than anything, it was the refining of structure of online materials that ended up being the greatest benefit and really the cost analysis of how can I put my best amount of time and energy into, you know, the, the fluency I've gathered with multiple teaching styles. Things like flipping a classroom, even in fourth grade, became so much less daunting, regardless of how far you were into your career, because you had to, to live through that time frame. So I guess my, my, my next question really leads into how have you seen it turned from a launching point and where do you continue to see it grow? And are there other opportunities that you see mainly from the community aspect now that, uh, students and staff are kind of competent in those ways. And while you're kind of generating that, like I'll, I'll lead in and say, I've been, I've been blown away to see the competency of a fourth grader to be able to navigate what I spent weeks at the beginning of the school year to become, you know, comfortable with, you know, the apps and the online platforms and all these things took up so much time that, you know, Ken and I talk very frequently about if I'm going to expect them to do you know, this to a level of proficiency, I want to make sure that I teach them. So there's no question there. I feel like that has been taken away and, and I'm spending a fraction of that time to provide the parameters and, you know, high focus at our high school level, you know, the students have almost lived in this, 
independent learning environment, you know, independent study, that they're spending time and energy so much more at finding internships or, you know, these college transition periods at our high school has actually adopted a kind of part-time in-person and part-time, you know, career path that really was a reflection of what happened in that adjustment. Hey, you know, we don't know when we're coming back to school, so we're going to do the best, but really change your, your lens, you know, focus where you're, you know, best interested in and, and, you know, where you think you're going to find yourself spending your time regardless anyway, whether a teacher's in front of you or not. Well, I think the shift happens when the shift came out of necessity, but it continues because it worked. And that's, I mean, that's kind of what it came down to for us is that, you know, we had to shift because that's where we were, but then we were like, oh my goodness, if this works, well, why would we not do it then if it works? And <laughs> I mean, otherwise we just keep doing all the stuff that we used to do. And I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with that stuff. It's just that if you're never looking at it, then now you got issues, but um, and if it's if it's good practice, it's good practice. I mean, if it's good practice 20 years ago and it's good practice now, those you know that, that's great. But if there's something new that you can attach to, it it changes the conversation about whether or not people are going to actually try it. And now that they tried it and saw that it worked, how can you make sure that you support them to make sure that they continue to do that and don't fall back into what was comfortable for them? So. I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit here because I know something that you you have done a fantastic job for your district and something you encourage a lot of educators to do is to share your narrative, share your story, uh, you know, uh, market your classroom in the sense that let people know what goes on behind behind the classroom walls. And it's it's a conversation we've talked about a little bit on the podcast. We've had some conversations about effective ways to to communicate with parents and meeting them where they are. But I would love to just, you know, get your insight for our audience because most of our audience is teachers. We do have administrators that listen as well, but what are ways to, to start to work down that path? If you as a classroom teacher have not done much to, to tell your story of your classroom, other than maybe a little bit of email communication or some newsletters, and then on the, on the school side or a district side, how can you, how can you do that as well? Well, I think you have to see the value in what it does, because if you don't get the immediate gratification for the work, all of a sudden you start to wonder why you're doing the work. And if it's more work, then all of a sudden you're like, well, I'm not getting anything out of it. So why should I even do it? Because it's not really working. And I think you have to develop yourself, develop a process that works for you, but also that leverages the story. I, you know, we, I wrote, wrote a book, gosh, my, it must have been 2013 or something like that. It was, it was a long, long time ago. And it was called The Power Branding. And we wrote it, my friend Tony and I wrote it. And it was the, the, the book is actually called The Power of Branding, Telling Your School Story, right? And so it's so interesting to me that here we are nine years after that book was written. And that message, I think, got watered down along the way. It's not just about telling the story. It's about leveraging to make sure that you get the most momentum for the story that you're telling so you don't feel like you're talking to the wind. And so we've been really cognizant about the leverage points for the work that we do to make sure that the work that gets out there is getting as much, uh, you know, it's, it's being amplified as much as it can. As again, the analytics are still working, like you're getting the most push um, and everything that goes along with it. So to, I say that because you have to decide what kind of story you're going to tell, how you're going to tell it, where you're going to tell it, and who you're going to tell it to. And we talk about the ABCs of, of that process, finding your audience, building your brand and connecting the two, right? Um, and so we've been, we've really, we're really cognizant about that. But the idea that we keep in mind for teachers is, are you, do you set up a system in your space where everybody's willing to recognize great work, acknowledge great work and extend great work, right? Are you in your right mindset to see great things that are already happening in your classroom? Do you, so do you acknowledge after you recognize that because you're in the right mindset, do you then acknowledge to the person that's doing great things that they're doing great things? And a lot of people do that. You tell a teacher, you tell a kid that they're doing great stuff. You tell a teacher that they're doing great stuff, right? But when you do the third thing, 
when you extend the conversation to somebody who wasn't there to tell the person who didn't see it about the great things that are happening in that space, what inevitably happens is the person that you tell it to is going to not only talk to the person that was doing the great stuff, but they're also going to tell somebody else about it. And now we get some momentum. So we always think about leverage points. What are the, what are the things that we can do to make sure that we leverage the message? And it's not just about telling the story. It's about leveraging the moment because there's a difference between storytelling and there's a difference between telling somebody something and connecting to the emotion of the event. Because when you connect to the emotion of the event, then there's a better chance for that story to be told well beyond the time that the event takes place. You know this just as well. Everybody knows this. If something hits you emotionally, you're going to talk about it. If it was just something that was said out loud, you're not. So how can you connect emotionally to the moment that makes people feel something that they want to talk to somebody about beyond the time that the event took place? So we're always thinking about that. We're, Chip and Dan Heath wrote a great book called The Power of Moments. And in it, they talk about why people remember certain things about events and that, why they don't remember other things about events. And they talk about the, one of the things that, that I think is really that we use a lot is people remember events that boost sensory, break script, raise the stakes, and break the script. So what are you doing to boost sensory, connect to the emotion, right? Raise the stakes, do something that you haven't done that, that raises up the level of the emotion, and break the script. How often do we do things on a regular basis that we just go to the next thing because it's the next thing? So if you can be the one to break the script, then all of a sudden you provide a moment that can get talked about. And we think about this all the time, good and bad. People are going to remember certain things that break the script. And we talked, you know, this has been a pretty big week for me as I decided to move on and we're going to try something different next year. But the interesting thing about telling people that I wasn't coming back at the end of this year was all the stories that get told about what happened when we were here and the stuff that we were doing. And I got, I've gotten text messages from people over the course of the last two days that said, do you remember when you did this? I didn't remember that I did that, but I knew it broke the script. And when it breaks the script, it changes the conversation, how we offer jobs to people, you know, being in a classroom when you're not scheduled to be in a classroom, telling a teacher, just get out and go take a break, take a walk. I got your class for a little bit right now. Well, you know, when I, I was, uh, I was trying to think of some other things that people sent to me. Oh, um, you know, walking home from school and you see some kids playing basketball uh, and you go play basketball with them for five minutes, right? I played with these kids for five minutes and it was seven years ago. And that was the thing that came out on Facebook today. Like little things like that, when you break the script, it creates emotion. It creates a moment. And then that becomes the thing that it's going to be talked about. And these moments are around us all the time. Just like we were talking about with Colin. When he talked about the things that happened in my second grade classroom, when I had him as a second grade student, I didn't remember him because I was so fixated on getting to the next thing. And if I'm invested in the moment, not only is it better feeling for me, but I'm going to tell that story to somebody. And now all of a sudden that story has a better chance to be told, which means that the people who didn't, who haven't been in school in 25 years are now getting a better opportunity to see what's actually happening in school. So, and people say, well, it's, that's more work. Well, yeah, it's more work. But if you think about it as the right work done more, I don't have any more time than you do, than anybody does. So I'm just trading it. I'm trading it on the front end. So I don't have to defend the work on the back end, right? We talk about the idea that there's a distinct difference between being proud of something and defending something, right? Like I can tell you what people are proud of when they go to their phone, go to their photos app. They look at the kids, pet, house, car, hunt, fish, cabin, boat. It's all on your phone. And you'll tell stories about that stuff all day, right? But when, you, because you know you walk out of those conversations feeling better than when you walked in. And that's where you want to be. So if you're always promoting stuff, if you're always being proud of stuff, there's a better chance for you to feel better, which means you're going to want to come back to it. There's that shot of, you know, adrenaline that you get when you see a bunch of people liking the stuff that you're doing online. And you're like, man, I'd like to do that again. Let's do it again. Right. Now are days that it doesn't happen. But if you get enough of those days where you're all doing it together, it makes you want to come back and try it the next day.
breaking the script is is what's really sticking with me with that. <clears throat> and when I think back to my own classroom and my days of teaching fifth grade, the moments that I had parents and students reach out to me, reach back out to me, were exactly when I was breaking the script. Right. I in 2000, I want to say 14 or 15, I started a class Facebook page yeah. because I was using Twitter and I was getting absolutely no feedback right. from any parent whatsoever. And that was really my intended audience. I started a Facebook page and I had parents calling me saying, thank you for yeah. putting pictures on there. I love seeing the pictures and videos of my kids. But then fast forward to May, I wonder how much they were enjoying that as much because I wasn't doing much different on that Facebook page. So I feel like I should have been breaking the script in some way to just post differently or share in a different way. So it didn't become, it didn't become watered down for them. And even moments that, you know, I, what's neat about my position now is I'm in the middle schools and the high school. So a lot of the students I've taught, I get to see now as middle schoolers and high schoolers. And it's the same thing. The moments they remember are not the moments that, that I necessarily remember. And it's, it is harder, but it's, it's, it's very doable. And now, what it, it, gives you, it gives you the leverage. You feel... Right. So it, you think about... Matt, so what's something that us... you feel you could do? Sorry, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I was going to say, I think about this. In 2006, 2007, 2007, I, uh, we, were, we were hiring a third grade teacher. And I was, it was my second year as a principal. And we were going to hire a third grade teacher. And we had two other third grade teachers. And it was in a bigger district. And so we were going through a bunch of the, like the red tape to get the person hired. And so people were, they, they kept asking me, when did you hire? Did you hire? Did you ask her? Did you ask her? When are you going to ask her? Are you going to ask her? When are you going to ask her? And I got to, I got to be so, I was just getting so sick of being asked. I finally just said, Hey, why don't you call her? Why don't you call her? I mean, I, I was going to call her. You can call the people that didn't get the job too, if you want that. Right. But you know, why don't you call her and offer the job? And so I'm sitting outside of our conference room. And these two teachers walk into the conference room and they call the, the candidate and then they offered the position to the candidate and I heard a scream and then I heard another one and I was talking to my secretary who was out there with me and I turned to her, I said, Betsy, I'm never not going to do it this way again. I'll never not do it like this again, right? Because the moment that we provided for those three women at that particular time is something that is still talked about. It was talked about last week. It was talked about last week. And that was 2006. Okay. And it lasted 30 seconds. So let's be honest about these moments. They don't have to be over the top. I let someone call and offer a position. That was it. And now it becomes, now it's become a whole thing. Now we offer the positions in like a bazillion ways, but I mean, that's how it started, and it broke the script. So, Matt, what do you think? What are you doing to break the script that makes it different for you? Well, I think <clears throat> the breaking the script really comes down to that that position, as we kind of all have talked about, of letting kids have their own interpretation of how something should look. You know, as simple as that, or, you know, the my classroom is very animated and colorful and those type of things. And, you know, when we do a dress up day or, you know, we're celebrating a national holiday that no one else celebrates, we go all in because, you know, and I, I frequently say like, I can get away dressing or celebrating or, you know, being silly or whatever the case may be, because we teach kids. And that's the beauty of being in this position of constantly like, I have a different outfit for every day of December. I have more onesies that people donate to my classroom because I'll wear pretty much anything and everything. Do I have to do any behavior management systems or no, my kids just love being in my space with me because it is a place that they're cared for. And the experiences often are kids bringing the opportunity, the thoughts, the creativity, the passion projects that they started, you know, I, I have an example I've talked about in the past where I had a kid who had had a concussion, got another concussion the next week, didn't want to give up his screen time to work on. He was doing a 3D model of a, a dream house he was building. So a, a fourth grader getting up at four in the morning when his parents were all asleep to complete a project so he wouldn't miss it, yet he wouldn't be in front of his mom, you know, to, to get yelled at. 
like those are the the type features where when you put it in the hands of a collaborative process that you know true situation where you're where you're agreeing to give up that control and that that giving up that control even in your position and talking about that hiring there is a a gratification when you know you have to call those candidates that you didn't give it to that at least you had that great conversation of what the way that you did but you were able to sidestep that and realize that you can get that gratification not having to do it either and i think that is us as as I don't want to say egotistical, but we put a lot of work in that we want to, you know, acquire the joy, you know, upfront and in fr- like without deny because we are questioning it. You've you've mentioned a few times if we can't really pick up on it, is it really there? Yeah, that is a a real thing for us is to to trust if it's happening or not. So you you mentioned about your. You're going to be moving on to a new project or, or new adventures in your in your professional career this summer. And so what I would love to ask you is you've clearly made an incredibly massive impact on Fall Creek, Wisconsin for the last 12 years. It's evident in what you see on just anytime you would explore your district's website, your social media, and, and mostly in the way that you speak and in, in the stories that you tell. What would you say... When you look, if you look back on Fall Creek three years from now, what is a a legacy that you really hope to see? Because I think there's so many legacies that you're going to be leaving because of the way you've rolled it out, because of the way you put the teachers first. It starts with the teachers. Everything you do seems to be a grassroots effort. And I think that's going to allow for so many of those things to continue on. But if you had to pick one thing that has changed in your 12 year tenure, what would you hope that one thing would be that would never go away from Fall Creek, Wisconsin? Oh, man, that one's easy. So I tell people all the time around here that my only hope for you is that you feel the way that I feel when I talk about you. Because if you feel the way that I feel when I talk about you, there's no way you're not going to feel great about the work that you do. And my biggest thing that happened over the course of 12 years was These people were phenomenal the day that I walked in, right? And they're going to be phenomenal the day that I walk out. I'm just super, super loud. So when I think about the idea that it was special before I got there, it's going to be special after I leave. But if I was able to help people kind of shine the light on some of the great things that were happening because I'm really loud, then I'll take that, walk away with that, and be happy about that because these people deserve, they deserve to walk through places in other states, in airports, at amusement parks with their Go Cricket stuff on and be recognized and asked questions and go to conferences and have people take pictures with them because of where they're from and they've heard stories about what they do. They deserve that. They deserve those moments. And if shining the light on them gives them those moments, then I'm going to walk away feeling real good about the work that we do. Right. Because they were again, they were special before I got here. They're going to be special on July one. That's just what it is. They're just good people. They're incredible people that have great hearts. And all I want is to make sure that there's nobody in the in the world that hasn't heard of Fall Creek, Wisconsin. And that's not going to stop on June 30th. Man, I'm still going to be out there talking about the great things that are happening. And my hope is that everywhere I go somebody can recognize Fall Creek, Wisconsin, just from one story, one hashtag, one t-shirt, whatever the case may be. Well, I, I read your letter today and the thing that stuck out to me was when you, when you reflected on your interview for the position 12 years ago and you asked the school board member, how will I know if I'm succeeding as a superintendent? And they said, you know, just about what you said, that we do great things here, but not many people know about it. And when I read that, Everything that I've ever seen you do and everything that I've ever seen you heard you say all made sense to me. And I think it's it's so evident that you've taken that one question and you've run with it. And it's obviously grown into so many things, but the passion projects, the, the everything that you've talked about tonight, you could boil back to you want other people to see the great things that are happening 
in your classrooms and, and with the students of your district. And so I just think there's so much to be said that when we pick that one passion, when we pick that one mission, whether we're a classroom teacher, a principal or a superintendent, when we have that hyper-focused mission, you can accomplish so much because it all stems from that one place. And, and for me, mine was always, I'm going to do what I think is best for students. And if I could justify it around that, uh, that's when I took risks. That's when I asked for forgiveness instead of permission, because it started it started from that place. And and it just it just really hit me when I when I read that because it it just all made sense and it just made everything so clear about about what you do and and what I know you'll continue to do. So I would love to continue this conversation as long as possible, but I do want to respect your time. So we ask the same four questions to every guest every week. We call it our exit ticket. So I want to jump into those and 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 wrap it up for us us here tonight. So the first question, what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better? Know them. No, just know them. Know what they love, what they don't love, why they come to school, why they don't come to school. Know them. Make sure you know something about them that's, you know, that's unique. Make sure that you know something about them that if you have to break the script, you can break the script in a second. I love it. Um, what's the best piece of advice that you feel like you come back to and uh, might have been received from a colleague, a supervisor, or even a student? My mom told me that you're always interviewing for your next job. So everything we do is intentional with the, with the understanding that at some point you're always moving on. So if you're always moving on at some point, how are you going to be remembered the, the second that you leave? So how intentional are you with all these interactions? The other thing that I would say is that I had a professor in college uh, in my doctoral program named Nancy Blair, and she said the greatest gift of service you can give to any human being is for the time that you are with them, they are the center of your universe. And if that happens, then they not only are invested in the conversation with you, but they talk about that conversation a heck of a lot differently when they walk out of that conversation. Hmm. That may lead into our next question pretty well. Um, so we know that the school year goes in waves. Uh, you definitely feel it in your role. Um, there are times that are a little bit easier, and then there are some that, you know, you're crawling through the mud. What is something that you feel like you, you frequently share in those times of challenge to help educators power through and power up through those moments of struggle? Find your purpose, whatever it is. I think about writing that book. When I wrote the book, the 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 uh, lead from where you are book, I woke up at you know five five thirty tomorrow. I jumped out of bed at five fifteen five thirty because I knew I was going to find purpose in the writing. And I don't write. I'm not a writer at all. I do not write well, but I found purpose in reflecting on what the impact was going to be, and um, and it, it just got me going. So when you can find purpose in the moment, you're going to find yourself moving a little faster, being a little sharper, even in those times where things aren't going the way that you want them to. I love that answer. And it's not like any answer we've gotten for that, that question. I, I really, I really appreciate that. So it's easy to fall into facilitating a repetitive classroom. What do you think is the aspect for teachers who are the ones constantly seeking to change, innovate, and adopt new teaching strategies in their classroom? What's the what? Tell me again. What's the what? What 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 separates the teachers oh. who are the ones that are constantly seeking to change, innovate, and and improve yeah. their classroom? They go. It goes right back to the first question you asked, Ken. Honestly, it's do you know the people that you're that you're leading? If you're leading, you know, kids who are eight, or you're leading, leading kids who are eighteen, or if I'm leading a group of people that's you know ages twenty three to fifty eight, whatever it is, do I know them well enough to know and understand? what they need to get better and how am I providing that opportunity? We talk with our group a lot about the idea that if I'm going to ask you to do something, we're going to provide time, resource, and opportunity. If you're thinking about it that way, you know, then the flag, you have some flexibility within the context of what you do at the same time, you're meeting the need for the people that you're serving. Beautiful. So, you know, you have some exciting adventures coming up. How would you suggest we best tag along and, uh, you know, follow on your, your next steps in, in the journey? Well, everybody's been asking about these walks that I do. You know, I walk to school and I do the one minute walk to work. And if there's no work that I'm walking to, 
what's mm. going to happen. I'm going to be walking to somewhere. <laughs> so I don't know. The hashtag's probably not going to change. It's just that work might be around the block because I don't even have a job night right now. I don't know what I'm going to do next year. I have no idea what I'm going to do next year. But at the same time, I know that uh, I'll be walking somewhere and I'll be talking about how we can be, you know, be better and, and help each other out. A lot of those walks, there's like 90, over 90 of those walks right now. And almost every one is something that I screwed up. So let's think about how we can help each other out. If I screwed up 90 things over the course of the last four years that I've been doing those walks, then you're okay, whatever you're doing. Don't worry about it. We're going to keep following, keep following along there. And uh, I'll keep the, all the social media stuff going. But, um, I, you know, follow the Go Crickets hashtag. That's where all the work is happening. Again, I'm not that – I'm just loud. They're still doing the special stuff. You want to see great people doing great stuff, keep following that Go Crickets hashtag because that's where the magic is. I'm just really loud about the magic. Excellent. Thank you so much. We will link up to your books, your – your Twitter, your social media handles, as well as those hashtags in our show notes page, as, as well as the podcast and YouTube description. Joe, I, I can't thank you enough. I've been excited about this for weeks. It was such a pleasure for me to hear you speak in, I think it was December. I'd been, you were on my list of keynotes I had wanted to see for, for a long, long time. And then even seeing the follow-up follow presentation and even just getting to have a, a short conversation with you as well. Uh, educators really appreciate the fact that you are so relevant, you are so real and authentic. And, you know, it's very easy for large audiences as well as Matt and I right now to just feel like we can trust you and we can ask you the hard questions because you are authentic. And the the impact that you've had not only on your district, but education as a whole, uh, it, it can't be stated enough. So please, whatever you transition to, please continue to impact education as, as I know you will. And and help us make teaching and learning and leading kids and children a much better place than it was 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So, Joe, thank you again so much for giving your time to us. And, Matt, why don't you take us on out of here? As we power down this episode, without a doubt, Joe, you left us feeling powered up. Thank you for the time. And, everyone, stay well. Um, keep on pushing. I know it's a fun time of year. So um, really dig in and, and give it your best. So we will talk to you next week. Thanks. Right, go, go Crickets. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to or watching us on YouTube. Each week we get to talk to amazing educators who are making a positive impact on the lives of students, their colleagues, administrators, and education as a whole. It's been such a privilege every week to be able to talk to these incredible individuals, learn from them, grow with them, and better myself and all of education through these conversations. If you haven't already, please consider sharing this with a colleague, someone who can benefit and be powered up from the experience of listening to these incredible conversations. Because of Powered Up, we are powering education by empowering you.